to welcome everyone to, to this session. I'm, I'm really interested in it. I was able to help a little bit with the uh, American History textbook uh, that we did in the Open Textbook Project. So I'm really interested to see uh, what Ben has. I know he's worked some with Marie. If um, you are interested in uh, distributing this or seeing the session later, um, it will be on our iTunes U site, which is uh, in the ch uh, chat box now. And uh, I'll be monitoring the questions. If you have uh, questions as we go, we'll take a look at those and, and get them to Ben. And that's about it. So thank you very much, Ben. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, as you can see, the title of my talk is Presenting Learning uh, to the Public Using WordPress as an Assessment Tool. Um, before I begin with really my content, I should introduce myself a little bit. So I'm a historian of Antebellum America. Uh, my particular research focused on issues of race and issues of social reform, um, mostly through a history of religion. The questions that I'm interested in are how uh, does how have folks understood social injustice, particularly around issues uh, of race and ethnicity in the United States and really around um, the Atlantic world? So I lead with my content specialty because really that's, that's how I understand myself. My secondary interest in the digital humanities and using uh, educational uh, technologies is very much secondary. Uh, I have to be very careful when I give talks like this because there are folks that actually do know how to use technology in sophisticated ways. Um, and I have to admit that I'm a bit of a novice kind of stumbling uh, around. But uh, this stumbling has actually proved quite successful. Um, it's not only changed the way in which I teach my courses, it's led to a couple of projects um, integrating some of these lessons as well. Uh, I heard Mark mentioning the, the digital textbook um, that the USG system has, has produced. I've actually did, did my own American history textbook, uh, the American YOP, which is, uh, again, another open educational resource, free and online which used some of the uh, web design techniques that I just kind of figured out myself stumbling through my courses. Um, and that's available at AmericanYop.com. I've done a couple of these other projects as well, as well as created a blogging forum where myself and uh, I think we're up to 16 other contributors now all reflect on pedagogy, particularly in uh, American history classes. That's at uh, teachingushistory.co. No M, couldn't get the M, but teachingushistory.co. So that's me. I am an uh, assistant professor here at Abraham Baldwin Agricultural College, teaching mostly American history classes. Uh, what I want to do today is really two things. I want to walk you through what I've done, how I've used uh, WordPress in my courses in the past. Um, from there, I want to actually talk about what you can do to get started. I'll, I'll spend most of my time on the first point, uh, focusing on what I actually did. Um, I know that when I'm in, in these courses, the, the theory is less interesting, less interesting to me than the actual practice. So I'm, I'm in some ways going to just kind of walk you through these courses and you can see uh, what I did. Uh, my talk will take absolutely no more than 40 minutes, so we'll have plenty of time um, for what I hope will be a robust um, Q&A session. So these, I would say, are really the benefits of what I'm going to call shared learning, the benefits of using WordPress as a kind of organizing tool uh, for courses. Now, some of these things you can accomplish using D2L or any other learning management system. Uh, the difference, however, is the way in which the public plays in. So one of the first uh, differences is shared learning uh, aids as I try to move towards differentiated instruction. The second is that it can provide a housing for blogs, uh, facilitating online conversation, that don't necessarily have to stop at the boundaries of the course. Uh, the conversation can continue after the course ends, and it can also uh, reach out to individuals not enrolled in the course as well, which I think is an exciting opportunity for students uh, to think about learning, not necessarily in the tiny boxes of this is the course I have, these are the assignments I have to complete, this is the grade that I have to get, but rather this is an opportunity for me to engage in a learning community, uh, both for credit and beyond. Uh, second. Uh, there are ways in which you can use some pretty cool external plugins. And I'm going to walk you through some of the plugins that I've used before. Um, many of these will be more relevant specifically for history courses, but I think that you could find ways in which you could adapt them or use them uh, for your courses as well. Uh, the first are timelines. How you can use timelines to get students to visually see um, change over time, 
and to kind of wrap their head around uh, uh, complex topics. Second is using a very popular tool, Tumblr. Uh, I have used Tumblr to get students to create their own archives, their own kind of spaces where they can create um, evidences of their own learning. Uh, the fifth is through Prezi. I assume that many of you are probably familiar with Prezi as a presentation tool. Um, I think it's also really a useful way to require students not only to organize a presentation, but to actually illustrate um, connections, uh, ideological connections, chronological causation connections, uh, topical connections, how do ideas relate to one another. So I'll talk about mapping ideas um, through Prezi. I'm going to talk about Wikipedia a little bit. Um, not necessarily directly re uh, related to this, this issue of shared learning, but uh, Wikipedia is something that I guess we all have to reckon with. And uh, through my courses, uh, my digital courses that use, it, use WordPress, I've encouraged my students to engage uh, with Wikipedia. And, and I'll walk you through that a little bit. Um, also, using actual maps. So I've talked about mapping ideas uh, figuratively through Prezi, but actually using physical digital maps um, to get students to see uh, change over space and time. Uh, I'll talk about the ways in which GIS maps, uh, which can be constructed by your students, can interface through a WordPress uh, constructed class. Finally, uh, I'm going to end by saying that one of the one of my beliefs is when you commit to sharing uh, learning, asking your students to share their learning with public audiences, is you should also share your uh, achievements and your limitations. Um, so taking the personal risk to letting your students to assess you publicly. Functionally, this isn't that big of a risk. We all know about Rate My Professor. Our students publicly assess us all the time. But I think doing so within the, a more controlled environment of a course uh, can have real benefits. So this is where we're headed. Uh, let's start with this discussion of differentiation. Hmm. Actually, it looks like before that, I just want to briefly uh, give you a sense of the actual courses that I've taught. Um, so I'm going to just show you the web pages uh, that I've made. This first one was a course that I created in the spring of 2013 that I taught while I was a graduate student at Rice University. As you can see here, the course is called The Rise and Fall of Atlantic Slavery. And actually, I'll invite you, if, if, if you're like me and you're going to be multitasking during this uh, experience, pulling up a couple of windows, uh, if you're not, that's fantastic. But if you are that way, you may want to pull up riseandfallofslavery.wordpress.com. Again, that's riseandfallofslavery.wordpress.com. Uh, this site is still publicly viewable um, on that at that URL. A year later, I took the lessons that I had with this first experiment of, um, of using WordPress, and I made uh, uh, another website that my students and I worked on together on a course called The History of the End of the World. Um, that might be a kind of a, a strange topic, so I'll explain it by saying it, it explores how uh, human beings have envisioned the world ending uh, across world history. So the subtitle that my students came up with is that this is a course uh, about how the world will end from Mayans to zombies. Uh, so we explore these issues. And uh, I'm also in the process of finalizing preparations for a course, uh, Slaves to be Taught Next Fall, called Borderlands in Rural America. Um, this course will explore how colonialism and imperialism um, has affected um, the experience of colonized peoples from the 15th century all the way through the present. Um, here at ABAC, we have a real focus on, on uh, life in rural communities uh, across history. And we're going to look at rural communities as borderlands, both political borderlands, cultural borderlands, and the like. Um, so I did want to start by, by talking about the content I'm trying to teach. Because I think that when you think about uh, how you want to have shared learning executed, you have to start with your learning objectives not necessarily starting with the technology. Uh, the rest of my presentation might seem a little bit technology heavy, um, but I do want to ground it kind of in what the learning objectives of these individual courses are. So let's have a conversation then about differentiation. Um, so I was actually, as an undergraduate, a uh, high school teacher. Uh, I was going to be a high school teacher uh, at the same time as I was pur pursuing a, a major in history and then eventually on into graduate school in history. And I remember being very acutely aware as an undergraduate um, in a pedagogy class how much creative thought there is in how we should teach. And then I remember going right down the hall to my history class and seeing somebody not use any of that research uh, in the way that they were teaching, much like they had probably been teaching for several decades. 
So I try to bring a little bit of innovative pedagogy into my courses, drawing on uh, actual research that goes on in pedagogy. And I would say that there is no term that continues to be such a popular buzzword as differentiated instruction. Uh, our students learn differently, and so we should try to reach them differently depending on their different needs. Now, differentiation can look uh, different depending on exactly what you're trying to reach. Students have different learning levels, so if you want to differentiate, differentiate your instruction, you can try to work to those different learning levels. Uh, students learn in different processes. You can create different ways of learning. Some students are more visual, some students are more hands-on, some students are more auditory uh, and the like. Um, learning environment and finally content. Uh, with my WordPress courses, I try to focus on allowing students to differentiate based on the actual content, letting them find subtopics within the wide, uh, wider topic that they want to focus on throughout the course. Giving the students the chance to kind of pick will give them a little bit more buy-in. And I think that an advantage of using WordPress or using another form of kind of shared learning is that these students that are off in their differentiated tracks can come together and have a space where they can see the learning that each other is doing uh, and engage with one another in this, this way as well. So let me give you an example of how I tried to differentiate instruction in uh, my first WordPress course on the rise and fall of slavery. This is going to be a small course capped at 15 students. So I came up with a series of subtopics within the broader topic of, of uh, the history of slavery and abolition. And I encourage students to take some time and think about a subtopic that might be of interest to them. Uh, once the students picked this subtopic, uh, and it was done on a first come, first serve basis, um, they would stick with that subtopic throughout the course. And each week, no matter what we were reading, they were responsible for pulling out uh, the aspects of this subtopic and sharing it with the wider class uh, through each of their assignments. So I assume that many of you probably use blogs in some capacity, uh, and WordPress is, is on some level ultimately a site for blogs. Um, I, I, I like using student blogs for two reasons. The first reason is, and I remember teaching my first kind of small seminar discussion style class, in dealing with the very first discussion where we had where the students sat down and I asked them, so what did you learn? Or I tried to get the discussion going and I remember it being very kind of difficult um, having to pull information out of students. So I find that using blogs can give students a chance to engage in that conversation uh, in a little bit of a safer space while also giving us a running start when we finally do meet in class um, and, and, and have to work together. So for many of you, this might be old hat using blogs, but let me give you an example of, of why I, I like doing this so much. And this is a copy uh, of just a, a, a screenshot here of uh, a blog entry that we had last spring. The students were assigned to write a very brief uh, 100 to 200 word reflection on how they found, uh, on what they learned or what they found that related to their subtopic in each week's set of readings. Many students were also responsible for submitting at least two comments. Um, could, those comments could be to the same person, those comments could be to other people. Um, so I'm requiring the students to not only talk about what they're learning, but to engage in conversation with one another. So as you can see here, this first comment actually uh, gets a little bit testy. Uh, Genna is disagreeing with what Alan had to say. Uh, as an instructor, I have to say that this is great. The more my students are talking to one another and the less they're just kind of staring at me, uh, wanting the conversation to be a two-way, um, the, the more exciting the classroom can become. Uh, I was able to sit down when we finally met in class, jump right back into this disagreement, get Alan and Genna to clarify their positions, and ask other students to kind of weigh in and, and get the discussion going that way. Um, so I guess one of the, the clearest and most obvious advantage of a blog is it forces students to do some thinking before they come to class, making sure that our conversations can really hit the ground running. But of course, we can do this through D2L. What's the advantage of doing it um, through WordPress? Well, I would say the primary advantage is here. Uh, this was my previous class on the rise and fall of Atlantic slavery, and I was able to reach out to a number of historians who taught at other institutions when we were getting to the week that related to their research. Uh, I invited these other historians to read through the blogs that week and to offer a response. Uh, my students were very excited by the prospect of the fact that they would be in conversation, not just with me, uh, my novelty wore off pretty quickly, 
uh, but in conversation with the researchers who they were actually reading. So this is an example of, of feedback that the students got from a historian who teaches at Gardner-Webb University uh, named Joseph Moore, who was both reading the students' comments, giving them feedback, and then trying to move the conversation forward as well. Uh, one of my students asked me if I did this just because I was lazy and I didn't want to teach and I wanted to get the ideas from other teachers. And maybe there's a little bit of truth to that. But uh, the, the truth is I, my research expertise is only so limited. And it's really exciting when I can get research expertise uh, outside of the university and bring that inside of our classes. Uh, students seem to get a feed off of that uh, as well. So blogs have the obvious advantage when it comes to conversation. Um, the next couple of, of issues I'm going to talk about relate to visualization. Uh, students learn in different ways, and I think visualizing learning is important. Uh, of course, as a historian, change over time is, is really the nature of what we do, uh, so timelines lend themselves pretty clearly. But I think timelines can be useful uh, for other things as well. Chronology doesn't necessarily need to be traditional chronology, um, and a timeline can be a great way for students to present their learning collaboratively, uh, building something larger than themselves. Uh, we did it through a, a, um, a resource called Timeline.js. This is what the home page for Timeline.js looks like. JS looks like. Um, there are a lot of Timeline plugins that you can use out there. I can't recommend Timeline.js enough. It's unbelievably simple. You go to the website and you see this green uh, button right in the center of the screen where it says make a timeline now. You click on that and you're walked through an incredibly easy process on how you do it. Uh, I didn't want to kill class time. I didn't want to have to waste a lot of my prep time on figuring out technology. Um, so finding simple, easy plugins that I can put right into my WordPress site was important for me. Uh, Timeline.js was by far the most easiest to use uh, um, timeline visualization. This is what happens once you click that green button. You'll see that there are three steps that you have to do. Uh, you have to make a spreadsheet formatted in a certain way. You have to publish that spreadsheet using um, Google settings. And finally, you have to copy and paste the spreadsheet into the URL, and they will make a timeline for you. So let me talk about this first step here. This is where the student work actually came in. They had to make a spreadsheet. You'll see the blue highlighted uh, text there using our template. Timeline.js provided a template that the students could use, so they just had to dump content into this pre-existing template and then Timeline.js did the actual organizational work for them. So let's see what that template looks like. It's a very basic uh, Google Doc, and on the first day of class I had my students, those that didn't have it, or if they wanted to create a new one, create a Google account so we could work in these collaborative Google spaces. And we devoted a lot of time actually in class where they would take the content that they've been learning based on their subtopic, and they would track out a series of events. Each student was responsible for producing 15 events. So in a class, you can see that this is going to make a very large, robust timeline, something uh, much more involved than any one individual student could make, uh, but something that, uh, that would actually serve a function, that, that individuals that want to know a little bit about the rise and fall of slavery can use this resource, um, and, and folks, in fact, have. I know that other teachers have, issued, have provided links uh, to the timeline that my students made um, as a resource for, for their own learning. So each student was responsible throughout the semester of picking up things from the reading, moments uh, where we've got a moment in time, something that could be charted on a timeline. They each made 15 of these entries on this template. We went back to Timeline.js, uh, very simply copied um, the, the URL address of our template in, and the result was an interactive timeline that looked something like this. Um, it had uh, dozens and dozens, in fact, even I think a hundred um, different timeline points on here uh, that each student had created. Um, so it was, it was a nice way for students to see the sweep of the class visually uh, through a product of their own creation. Next resource I want to talk about is a little bit more straightforward and simple, uh, Tumblr. All of your students will be familiar with Tumblr. It's a very common um, micro-blogging platform is what it's actually called. Really, I find it mostly a space where people uh, create kind of micro-blogs or, or lists of images or even GIFs, visualizations, and these kinds of things. Uh, Tumblr is commonly used as a kind of a, a diversion and entertainment, if you will. But I wanted students to think about Tumblr as an archive. 
um, because this is what these things are. Um, these kinds of uh, websites, these kinds of uh, blogging sites are ultimately archives. So I wanted the students to create their own archive of primary sources that they found through research. They were able to plug these directly into our WordPress site um, by linking their Tumblr site to, um, to the site. So for example, this is one student's uh, Tumblr, at least the beginning of it. This student was charged with tracking um, racial ideology throughout the rise and fall of Atlantic slavery. So she was looking for documents that would show us um, the ways in which um, people understood and challenged and uh, reinforced uh, issues of racial ideology. So um, I encourage the students to take some creativity, think about how we want to represent this. Um, this student thought that the key would be to use the kind of cover pages of text. Other students wanted to use images. Others simply used all text. Um, uh, either way, it was a way for students to get started on a research project while at the same time thinking about how they should present their research to the public. For historians, we always want to be thinking about these kind of dual audiences, right? We write for uh, other academics, we conduct research, while also uh, we use museums and other tools to try to reach the public. And I wanted the students to think about both different audiences um, as they were doing their research. Because of course, the web kind of conflates audiences. Uh, we all uh, have access to the web, and the web um, will often give you an audience that perhaps you didn't intend. For example, uh, your boss taking a look at your, your spring break um, pictures. So this was uh, the use of Tumblr, getting students to think about creating an archive of their own primary source learning, setting them up for their own research, uh, while at the same time prevent, presenting uh, the documents, the items that, they've been, that they were finding uh, to the public uh, directly. Prezies, presentation. So the courses that I were teaching were technically called uh, writing intensive courses. Um, I had students had to produce a lot of writing, um, digital writing for that matter. Um, but they also, uh, I was also charged with making sure that students at one point or another created a presentation. So rather than just have the students produce a conventional, uh, you know, speech in class with a PowerPoint, I wanted the students to use a different tool uh, that plugs neatly into uh, WordPress. That is the tool of Prezi. Um, Prezi is, is cloud-based. So students could work on it uh, no matter where they were. It doesn't have to be housed on any specific computer. So whether we're working in a computer lab or the students are working uh, at home or somewhere else, they can access the exact same um, uh, function. But really what excites me about Prezi is the fact that it requires students to think in three dimensions as it relates to their ideas. Uh, PowerPoint, as we all know, goes in one direction. You go from one slide to the next. Prezi is actually three-dimensional. You can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can go up, down, you can go all kinds of different directions. So I wanted students to think about a presentation, not just as I'm going to say this, and then I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say this, but I wanted them to think about a presentation as my idea here is an umbrella for these sub-ideas. This sub-idea branches off in this direction, and the opposite direction is this other idea. So this actual three-dimensional uh, illustration of space uh, require students to actually put more thought into creating a presentation rather than just saying uh, one thing after another. So for the, my first course, the students were charged with uh, reading a book, Kevin Bales' Disposable Peoples, um, New Slavery and the Global Economy, where I wanted them to make con uh, connections between historical slavery and modern slavery based on their individual subtopics. Uh, at this point, Rice University is a quirky school, only had uh, six students. Um, and these six students picked these different subtopics, uh, which then linked to a YouTube page where they presented their Prezi publicly. Um, I learned to embed it a little bit more slickly in my next class where these PowerPoint videos were directly embedded into the course. Um, so these, these presentations were kind of three-dimensional um, presentational style. Um, also available online right there in the WordPress website. This is actually a copy of what they look like through Prezi. Um, these presentations are still available, still housed by Prezi. Prezi does not give you a time limit. Um, they will keep your presentations online uh, for as long as you'd like. Um, you, of course, can set settings if you don't want it turned to the public. Um, I did encourage students, however, to uh, set them as public as trying to kind of break down the boundaries of our learning community. 
So we have to talk about the behemoth uh, that is Wikipedia. You can't talk about any kind of digital learning without addressing this. Um, and really, there is no greater shared learning resource uh, than the community that has sprung up around Wikipedia. This is the way in which people are sharing learning um, uh, for the largest audience really in the world. So my obsession with Wikipedia as an instructor at least started um, when I was a TA at Columbia University. And I noticed that three quarters of my students all had uh, an incorrect answer, the same incorrect answer on the midterm. Um, it really confused me. Uh, my students were, it was explicitly laid out on, in the lecture. It was in fact even on a slide. And in fact, it was even mentioned on the study guide. How could they get this question wrong? Um, on a lark, I just checked to see Wikipedia. And it looks like my students were getting their information from this site. So I think we all have stories like this about the failures of Wikipedia. So I, I initially, began my teaching career with deeply suspicious about Wikipedia and, and believing that it had a pernicious effect on students. However, eventually I began to feel the sting of my own hypocrisy uh, because as much as I, I lamented and attacked Wikipedia, I also found that I used it on a nearly daily basis. So as I started to think more deliberately about constructing classes that encourage students to think about sharing learning publicly, I wanted to integrate Wikipedia into the process. Now, I know a lot of people have students write Wikipedia entries, and I think that this is a great idea. Um, my courses, I actually wanted to do something a little bit different. I wanted to make sure that students had a clear understanding of what Wikipedia is, while at the same time using it as a microcosm for the kind of conversations that scholars have um, in more controlled settings. So let me walk you through this assignment, uh, assignment I called uh, Wikipedia historiographies. Now, this word historiography is, is, a, is, a, is a favorite word used by historians. Uh, simply put, a historiography is the history of a history. Namely, how does our understanding of the past change over time? Um, I remember, for me as a student, the moment where I understood the history as dynamic, as changing, as uh, conversations, as arguments, was the moment when I actually really responded well to my history classes. And I try to pass that along to my students that what we think about the past has changed and probably will continue to change. Uh, in fact, much like Wikipedia changes. So what I had the students do is use the view history function on Wikipedia pages uh, and then write brief historiographies, that is, histories of the history of that Wikipedia page. Uh, these were the plugins to the final products uh, where the students had to pick images from the Wikipedia page uh, that they thought were most uh, illustrative of the content of the page. So let me explain what I mean here. Um, this is a Wikipedia page. And if you see up at the top right next to the search bar, there is a phrase that says view history. If you click on that on any Wikipedia page, you will see the history of all of the edits made on that page. I walk my students through a couple of pages this way and then ultimately assign them to find a Wikipedia page that related to their subtopic and um, write the history of that page. Now, this can be difficult because for a lot of these pages, there might be 1,500 edits made. Um, a lot of them, it's more like 500 or so. Most of these edits are very minor, just quick fixing punctuation. Uh, but I expected that my students would probably have to spend about three hours, maybe four hours, uh, fairly intensely reading through uh, the history of their Wikipedia page to produce their paper. They could take a shortcut, however, because as you see on this screen here, there is green and red numbers next to, or kind of right in the middle of each of these edits. That indicates the number of characters that changed. So this green number 277, that then has a red 277 above it, that's going to be a much more consequential edit than the one right below it, which says it's a red 4. So let me show you what happens if you zero in and actually click on one of these edits. You can see what the Wikipedia page looked like before the edit and then what it looked like after the edit. So I wanted my students to find the kind of most dramatic moments of change within each of these Wikipedia pages. In the top right hand of the corner next to the Wikipedia logo, you see where it says article. That's what we're looking at right now. If you hit talk, you actually go to a forum page that discusses the ideas behind each of the major changes. Um, these, this talk page becomes a kind of meta-commentary on how and why the Wikipedia page looks the way that it did. So this assignment uh, did a couple of things. One, I believe that it served as a kind of microcosm of the way in which historical knowledge is produced. 
that is through debate, revision, um, uh, kind of conflict, really. Um, it also immersed the students into a clear understanding of what Wikipedia is. Uh, that way they can have a better, more critical awareness as they go forward, as they continue to use this resource, because, of course, they absolutely will, um, as, as, they, as well they should. I use it, uh, as I said before, every day. Um, the end result was the students um, published their uh, assignments directly onto, um, directly onto the course web page. So let's, uh, let's move on to another uh, kind of plug-in I had, another assignment that I had my students do um, through WordPress, that is using GIS maps. Um, so for my courses, obviously geography is important. Uh, where stuff happened is just as important as when it happened. Um, so illustrating change over time, also uh, change uh, based on geography is important. Um, GIS maps is basically just, a, without getting into the technical definition, it's a digital map. It's technology that we can use to make digital interactive maps that aren't just flat maps, but students can manipulate, can show change over time, um, and the like. So let's talk about uh, how, we, how we did this. First of all, we start again with another Google Doc. All GIS maps are going to require spreadsheets. So using a Google Doc um, was, was, again, the first step. We again found a template, um, which I'll, I'll talk about how we found this template in a minute. Um, and uh, students had to, throughout the course, find a time and a place, find something that could and should be mapped. It can be a discrete moment, it could be a process, um, something that could be illustrated on an interactive map. Again, each student were required to produce uh, 10 to 15 of their own. Um, as a class, then, this means that we're going to have, even though we had a very small class, uh, in this class there were only 14 students, uh, we ended up with a very large map um, that, had, that had a lot more information than any one person could produce. And I like this idea of students being part of something larger than themselves when they learn. Uh, this is the way that most of us have to work, is that we aren't uh, fully autonomous. We're dependent upon others. We have to work with others. Um, and uh, I can't remember. Somebody once told me that if you're not a part of something bigger than yourself, then you're not a part of something that matters. So getting my students to see the value of kind of working together, um, even though they're seemingly working apart, making, um, making something valuable. So the students produced uh, these entries as we went throughout the semester. Whenever they found something that could be mapped, they were supposed to put in an entry. And I staggered some deadlines throughout the semester to make sure that we got them uh, roughly distributed throughout our content. Then we created a map that we plugged in directly to the text. Um, the software that we ended up using is a software called ArcGIS, which is produced by a company called ESRI, that's E-S-R-I. Uh, ESRI's ArcGIS is uh, available, um, I believe, at every USG institution. We have it here at ABAC, so I have a hunch that you have it uh, where you are. And it's quite user-friendly, quite easy to use. Um, so after we made the actual spreadsheet, we went and turned it into a map, and we put a plugin into our map. Now, unfortunately, um, this is where I ran into a bit of trouble. I wasn't able to get the full functionality in uh, embedding it, so what I ended up doing is just putting a link that this map actually was just a link to a, uh, a map that was housed on Esri's website. Um, no problem, the link went right there. Um, our students and our users and anybody else who was following the class could go straight to the map, um, and this is what you would see. There's a map of all of these moments of apocalypticism or somebody predicting or expecting the end of the world uh, over time. You also could illustrate over time how uh, these, these popped up in certain areas. So by mapping this geographically, my students were able to see some different things that they didn't see from their traditional things about how these ideas move over space and time. Um, ended up actually adding to the content of the class, not just making something kind of pretty and fancy, um, which, which again was a theme for my students. We don't just want to make things that are pretty and fancy. We want to make things that actually illustrate uh, content. So this was the map. Now. It takes a little bit of courage for my students to be willing to put themselves and put their work out there. Um, somebody asked a question uh, before this presentation started about the permissions required for students to um, uh, to put their work, make their work public, if, if there was any forms that I had to have my students sign. 
So I, I actually, I, I talked about this. I was concerned about this too. I didn't want to make students feel uncomfortable. Um, and what I was told is that as long as students have the option of uh, anonymizing their name, then uh, they, then, then it's no problem having them work um, collaboratively or work publicly. Um, I would encourage you to contact um, folks at your own institution. I think institutions might have different policies on this, um, but, but whenever I've done this in the past, it was as long as students have the option of having an anonymous uh, public identity, then it's fine. Uh, what's interesting is not a single one of my students has ever wanted to have an anonymous identity. They all like the idea of saying, this is what I'm learning. I want to stand behind this. I want to be able to point um, even friends and parents or future employers um, to what I did in this class. Um, I had a lot of students who were desiring careers involving technology, and they thought that participating in a class like this, producing work like this, uh, could be something that they could mention in a job interview. So uh, my students are putting themselves out there publicly. In a way, I suppose I was putting myself out there publicly. Um, but I wanted to do so also with the end of the course through reviews. I wanted to get my students to think about um, what the value of this kind of learning is for them um, and, and how it worked out for them. So I gave my students the option uh, of posting reviews to the course on our course website. And these yielded some pretty interesting results. This is, this is, uh, this is where the reviews were housed in, in this website. Right, and, and here's a sample uh, review. Um, I'll actually read uh, some of the quotes of, uh, uh, from this review. Uh, the student said, I would definitely encourage other instructors to make use of digital technologies. I feel like the use of digital media and technologies greatly complemented the class and did not detract from learning the material. So specifically, the weekly blog post she felt provided a great example. Being able to see others' thoughts prior to class helped me consider multiple aspects of the material and sometimes notice points or arguments that I might not have otherwise thought of. This student actually was very shy, had a really hard time speaking up in class, but the opportunity that she had to get her ideas out in a kind of more private uh, experience, or at least a more deliberative experience, emboldened her to then speak up more in class. Um, she also thought that the timeline enhanced her understanding of her subtopic, seeing how it fit into a lar larger picture. Again, um, we only have so much time in a class for students to learn so much, but having a chance um, to, for students to see the work of each other um, gets them a chance to learn more than even what they're, they're kind of able to process themselves, wait for them to share their learning with one another. Um, her focus was on slave resistance, and so the timeline was especially important for her um, because uh, of chronology. This is, this, is, this is how we work as historians, chronology matters. Um, writing the historiography of a Wikipedia article was one of her favorites. Um, she admitted that reading the edits of the page did get tedious. Indeed, it does. Uh, a lot of, of, of these, these edits are very tedious, moving commas and the like. Um, but she said that she could see the way that people uh, understood history, what they considered important changes over time. And uh, she really enjoyed accessing the discussion page um, to see the uh, editor's reasoning for changes that they were making. Um, so these reviews were, uh, were generally productive. I will admit I cherry picked one that I, I like particularly. Uh, but uh, for the most part, they were helpful. And even the ones that maybe may have stung a little bit um, was, was useful. Uh, again, I, I think if we're asking our students to put themselves out there, we should put ourselves out there as well. Um, I, I see a question come up, and I'll handle that one right away. Um, how, this, the question is, if students posted anonymously, how do we assess? Um, it's a great question. The students are posting anonymously publicly. I know what their pseudonym would be. So they might have, you know, it just might be, you know, ABAC student uh, 456. Um, the student has to tell me uh, who, who of them are ABAC student 456. Um, so I know who they are, so I can assess them. Uh, the public cannot, however. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of focus hands-on about how, what I did with WordPress. Um, but if you are interested in how you can get started, um, I'll just say that how I learned is I just started poking around. And really, I'm not particularly technologically savvy. I just went to WordPress and I started experimenting. If you want something a little bit more organized, I can recommend two different tutorial systems. Um, there are a couple, I think, within the USG, um, and I, I, 
I, I'll admit that I haven't looked at those, but the ones that I looked at um, are, first of all, WordPress 101. This, I think, is, is the best uh, easy tutorial to figure out how to use WordPress um, and, and, and some of the more advanced features that you can use. This site, however, is, uh, is not free. It's a very tiered pricing system, and if you push on them a little bit, they'll give you a great discount uh, as an educator. But if you want a free resource, uh, it's only a slight drop in quality uh, that you'll get from using WordPress Beginner. Just WordPress be or WPBeginner.com has a series of, of, of articles, of simulations, of videos that can walk you through how to get started um, with WordPress. The last thing I want to say about using WordPress or about using um, digital learning kind of collaborative spaces is the important, uh, of des uh, importance of design. I mean, I'm a historian. I'm not a designer. Uh, I don't have real training in this. Uh, but I, I really like this quote. Design is not just about kind of aesthetics. It's the interme intermediary between information and understanding. Um, I wanted my students to be able to create things that would enhance their learning, uh, enhance their understanding. Um, and what we learned is that how things are laid out, how things are designed, are actually really important for conveying information. So students learn best, I think, by being forced to teach others. And being forced to teach others using digital technology requires you to think critically about the way in which you present information and issues of design. Um, I have a few more, more things I could drone on about, but I would be more interested in having a, a question and answer session if anybody's been into it, or perhaps um, letting people lose to eat lunch early. Is the WordPress I have a question site, that I posted, Ben. Yeah, gotcha. Is the WordPress site findable? How public are they in practice? This is a great question. Um, so you can. You can set the WordPress settings to have uh, it show up in Google searches. And uh, my students, I, I, I let them decide. Um, they simply voted. Do we want this to be accessed by Google? They decided yes. So somebody can Google it if they Google the title of the course um, or other things like this. Um, also, you know, uh, how findable it is, it depends. I actually went out of my way to publicize it. I used uh, listservs on different content things. So for the history of the rise and fall of slavery, I wanted historians of slavery and abolition um, to keep an eye on what we were doing. I encouraged them to drop in on the blog uh, and comment on what students were up to. And I also went out and recruited a couple of them to give us some feedback as well. Um, and so that was, that was kind of fun. If you want, you can hide a WordPress site too. Um, no problem there. Also, if you want, you could create a more findable WordPress site. Um, I, I made all of mine as free sites, but for only five bucks, you could actually buy a domain name. Um, so instead of, for example, rise and fall of slavery .wordpress.com, or history of the end .wordpress.com, or abac borderlands .wordpress.com, you could cut out the WordPress and just have the title .com. Um, have other faculty picked up on this based on what students have said? Uh, so I was asked to give a, a talk at Rice University, the, the, what, the first version of this talk, a different version of this talk I, I gave at Rice. And I know that there are at least two other um, instructors, one in history and the other in either sociology or, or, or something else in the social science that experimented. You know what? I haven't been able to follow up to see if they've actually done it. Um, I know that people were interested. Uh, I also know that my students. Um, that at least one of them started pestering another one of their instructors to do something like this. Um, that they were doing a, a collaborative project and the students said, is there a way we can publicize it? They wanted to start getting, you know, le letting other people know what they were up to. So I don't know uh, if peer pressure is a thing. I guess that, that there's some of that, but um, I haven't seen as many people do it as I'd like. Hopefully maybe one of you does and, 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 and uh, I can take credit for, for what you do. Ben, do you, um, you know, WordPress, I participate in some blogs where, you know, someone posts something and then there are a lot of comments. Do you allow that from this public and, or how do you handle that? How do they, how do you monitor it? Is it, is that password protected or authenticated? That's a great, it's a great question. Um, the way that I have it done is the first time a user issues a comment, I have to approve it. Um, this cuts out on spam. 
um, because WordPress is, is notoriously a spam magnet. And unless you use very sophisticated anti-spam plugins, which uh, I didn't because I didn't have time, um, I'm ended, I end up moderating these comments. However, once an individual has an approved comment, uh, they may jump back in and comment any time that they want. Um, there was a part of me that was actually hoping that we might get one of these kind of um, snarky internet commenters that dominate, uh, you know, comment sections. Because uh, I think that it actually would be useful to turn that into a teachable moment to talk about ethics of commenting, uh, what it's like. Um, I did find that my students were a lot more comfortable criticizing one another's ideas in the comments of the blog rather than in class. And uh, that was a kind of a fascinating moment. Um, because I think as more of us have digital lives, as more of our work is presented digitally, um, we're going to have to deal with the fact that we're going to be engaging with that kind of digital commenting culture, much of which is very uh, snarky is generous, maybe just sometimes outright mean. Um, so getting students to think about how they commented um, was a kind of a useful moment to maybe make at least a couple more responsive, responsible internet users out there. I've got one more I want to ask them. Is the is the key? I mean, this is for face to face. Is the is the key difference the public aspect of it? I mean, between it seems to me that a lot of what we're using here <clears throat> you could use in D2L in the in the discussion section. Um, is is that what you see as the primary difference? Is the public aspect of it? Yeah. First of all, yes. But I think that, that means a couple of other things. Also, I mean, it's, I actually, I, I like D2L. I think some of my, my colleagues grumble about it, but I think that it's, it's pretty slick, um, at least once you learn it. Uh, but one, I wanted, I, I wanted the course to also expose students to different, um, different kind of ways of, of presenting information. You can't have a GIS plugin on D2L. Um, you can't have a timeline JS JS plugin on D2L. So using WordPress rather than D2L enabled me to use different um, instructional tools that I couldn't use just using D2L. But then you're right, the, the, the primary difference despite these tool things is, is the fact that it's public. And even though, um, let's say it's not super public, there's not a ton of people that are visiting the site, it almost doesn't matter. The notion for my students that this is a public thing I think changed the way that they approached and understood the course, changed the way they thought about their writing. Um, quite frankly, I think it got them to be a little bit more deliberative and critical uh, as they were engaging the material and producing stuff. So yeah, uh, the public is important. Um, even if the public isn't real, I think an imagined public was a great way to get my students to think about um, not only the quality of their work, but the way in which they're pitching it. You know, a lot of times students write papers addressed to me. I really like the idea of students writing papers uh, addressed to a, a broader audience. It put a little bit more burden on them to explain their ideas, to give background, and these kinds of things. 